Welcome to the Bitcoin Boomer Show. Here's your host, the Bitcoin Boomer himself, Gary Leland. And welcome to the Bitcoin Boomer Show. I'm your host, Gary Leland, the original Bitcoin Boomer. And like I said, welcome to the show. We have a great show here. We talk about Bitcoin, and then we talk some more about Bitcoin, and then we talk some more about Bitcoin. In other words, all we talk about in this show is Bitcoin. We don't talk about crypto. We talk about Bitcoin. I want to introduce my great producer here, Stephanie. Stephanie, you always uh, do the pre-shows with the guest. What's going on here this time with Will Cole? And what did, what did you uh, want me to make sure and figure out for you? Well, Will Cole works as head of the product with ZapRite. I know we've had, um, you said Parker Lewis was the other guest with ZapRite, but I'm curious what they do for businesses because I have a lot of friends who have businesses and just what makes them stand apart. I heard that you use them with BitBlock Boom, so just curious like what differentiates them in the marketplace for e-commerce like that, ZapRite. Well, that, that's a great question, and you're right. I do use uh, ZapRite for BitBlock Boom, and it's a great, great tool, which I'm sure we will definitely go over before this show ends, but that would be for my conference, BitBlockBoom.com, that I use ZapRite for. So we will cover that, Stephanie, as along with other, other important Bitcoin topics. But before we get going, I want to make sure everybody knows this show, and I'll say this over and over because I always do want to make sure I get this across, is to teach people about Bitcoin. That's all the goal of this show is, is to educate you about Bitcoin. I believe, like many other people believe, that there will come a day in the not too distant future that Bitcoin is a heavy part of how we pay for things, how we save money, how we... Uh, with it being digital gold, you know, it's a good way to preserve your wealth. All these things will come to pass, many of us believe. And I am trying to bring guests on the show who can help teach you about Bitcoin so when that day comes, you're ready and you're knowledgeable about Bitcoin. By watching this show, I believe you're going to learn enough about Bitcoin that if you watch this show on a regular basis, you will become a semi-expert on Bitcoin. And probably you'll orange pill yourself by watching this show and you'll start buying Bitcoin because it is the future. It is digital currency. It's digital cash. It's digital gold, however you want to announce it. Now, like I said, today we have Will Cole from ZapRite on the show. Uh, we've had Parker Lewis on the show, as Stephanie said before, talking about ZapRite, but this show we'll get into it a little bit more. I personally love ZapRite, and if you're operating a business and you want to accept Bitcoin, ZapRite is the way to go. We'll be right back after this word from our sponsor. And welcome back to the Bitcoin Boomer Show. Today, we have got a very exciting, exciting show for you. But before we get into the show, I do want to make a statement here. This show is not for boomers only. A lot of people get confused because it's a Bitcoin Boomer Show. And of course, boomers can watch this show and learn, but so can anyone. It's a show about Bitcoin, and I'm a boomer. So that's why it's the Bitcoin Boomer Show, not because it's for boomers, okay? So please, share this show with any friends you might have. Uh, they'll learn about Bitcoin in a friendly way, and before you know it, they'll become Bitcoin experts and may know more than you do about Bitcoin. Now, today's guest is Will Cole from ZapRite. It's someone I consider a good friend. Will, thanks for joining us on the show. How is it down there in Austin today? Oh, thanks, Gary. Thanks for having me. Um, in Austin, it's you know great, beautiful fall day. Uh, fall came early for us. Uh, a lot of traffic, but... Uh, There's yeah, always a lot of here. traffic. There's always a lot of traffic down there in Austin. Um, hey, before we... Yeah, you know, as you told me, it was uh, they built a big city and then <laughs> decided to build roads afterwards. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. That's, that's what I always think. You know, whenever I drive down to Austin, by the time I get to Georgetown, which is like... 30 miles away, I start hitting traffic, you know, and I'm 30 miles from Austin. So, yeah, that's a, that's a mess. Hey, give, us, give everybody a little bit of bio, a short bio about who is Will Cole. Sure, Gary. Um, so I've been a Bitcoiner for a long time. Uh, uh, first learned about Bitcoin in 2011. Uh, but more than anything, you know, I've been sort of in the Bitcoin world as an investor and then as a product person or a product manager. 
So I, I started my career in software development in 2006 when I graduated college, uh, focusing on software development, both as at the time uh, as kind of a front end, you know, engineer. Although I was terrible at that, and then later as what a lot of people call a product manager, just meaning uh, specifying products. Um, writing out specs, doing designs, that sort of thing uh, before we write code. And uh, during that time, I was also an entrepreneur. I started a lot of uh, businesses up in New York City, all of which that failed uh, and then ultimately joined a successful business started by a friend of mine called Stack Overflow that um, went on to um, you know a pretty large success as a software business. Um, but during that whole time I was at Stack Overflow, I was interested in Bitcoin and uh, uh, decided after seven years that I would actually work on Bitcoin, uh, use, use my skills to, to contribute to the space. Um, but yeah, um, you know, me generally, uh, I've been obsessed with Bitcoin for, what, 12 years now and, um, and spend most of my time uh, working on software. Well, being in Bitcoin for 12 years now, it, it's needless to say, you've seen a lot of changes and a lot of growth, you know, in that amount of time. And I pulled this off, and I'm, I'm, I'm saying that because I pulled this off your Twitter page. Uh, on April 1st, 2013, you made a, a post or poll. Would you rather own a Bitcoin or 50 euros for, in a European bank? So I have to guess that Bitcoin was around fifty dollars there, or fifty euros. But I find that to be a great poll <laughs> that you're asking. Do you want fifty yeah. bucks or a Bitcoin? Which would you rather have? That shows where we've gone. Yeah, I mean, it really does. Uh, I, I pinned that tweet for a couple of reasons. I remember why I tweeted that actually, which is you know it seems like almost like an April Fool's joke, but it wasn't. Uh, Bitcoin was fifty euros at the time. I think at the time that would have been. $65, $70, something like that. Um, and what had happened was there was a massive bail-in in Cyprus on that day, or maybe the day before. I learned about it on that day, where essentially what happened was Cyprus was in trouble, the government was in trouble, and they seized or claimed ownership over any amounts over $10,000 in a bank account. And so uh, that was a tongue-in-cheek way of trying to point out uh, Bitcoin's censorship resistance, uh, or not censorship resistance, but unconfiscatability, right? Where um, you know a lot of people just had found out that their money in their bank wasn't at, didn't actually belong to them because their counterparties, both in the banking system and in the government, had decided to claim ownership over those funds. So well, that was a fun day. I'm familiar with with that happening, um, but I didn't I didn't realize, or else I don't remember that it was any amount over $10,000. I thought it was like 10% or something. They scalped off everybody's um, everybody's bank accounts. They took off 10%. I didn't know it was like, yeah, we're gonna like take everything if you've got this much money. Yeah, to be fair, uh, I am not 100%, I, I'm not 100% sure on, on what exactly, I can't remember. You know, oh, I can't either. 11 so. years now at this point. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, but I remember it was a, it was defined as a bail-in at the time instead of a bailout, where essentially the citizens of Cyprus were being conscripted into this bail-in strategy where a certain amount of money that was in Cyprus bank accounts was going to be confiscated or at least was earmarked, earmarked to be confiscated. I should go back and look at that... Uh, that whole scenario I over again, wrong. but I, I remember feeling I at the there. time that this was a huge, uh, this was a huge validation point for Bitcoin back in 2013, where we hadn't seen many of them yet, right? And here we had a European country, uh, a, a, a seemingly stable country, um, seizing everyday citizens' funds. Yeah, well, that's a, that's a big deal, and some people are concerned that may happen here someday, since it's been happened somewhere before. Because even the money in the bank here is not yours. I mean, once you put it in there, um, so uh, I think another thing I found interesting is, and and Parker Lewis, he's been on the show twice, told me this. You and Parker have known each other since like kindergarten, and you're still like best friends. I mean, you know, that's a oh, long yeah. time, dude. And your business partners. I mean, that's a long time. Yeah. Yeah, so... Um, yeah, Parker and I have known each other since we were three years old, actually. Yeah, pre-kindergarten. <laughs> pre-kindergarten. 
<laughs> that that's a long time, dude. That's a long time to know anyone and be good friends with them and, and be able to work with them. So tell me, um, one more thing I saw here that I wanted to go over real quick on this was you have a site called the Tools of Ignorance. What is that? Well, it's where I've begun writing about lots of different things, although I started with uh, software development. Um, when I transitioned into working in Bitcoin full time, I'm doing software development, but uh, you know, a lot of what I learned was in the fiat world, um, you know, just, uh, doing things for companies like stack overflow. And I had a lot, I kind of wanted to get off my chest before I started writing more publicly about Bitcoin. I've been, uh, rather slow in finishing my first series here, but uh, I have my last, uh, sort of, uh, post on this series on software development called the invariance of software development coming up uh, in the next week or two. And then I'll be moving on to topics um, more centrally focused on Bitcoin. But um, really for me, it was just that, you know, outside of Bitcoin, I've had this and, it, and it's affected my life in Bitcoin for sure. Uh, I've had this entire career uh, around software development and product development that I wanted to get um, some of this off my chest and sort of describe how I work and how it's worked at scale for me. And uh, the invariants are basically an argument that no matter what type of, call it software methodology, one would use, um, that there are certain things that can't really escape doing in order to be a consistent product development team. And uh, I broke that down into five invariants, of which four I have posted, the fifth coming soon. And uh, you know, then I'll have that off my chest and we can talk more about Bitcoin. Well, I'm going to definitely have to go check that out because I, I wasn't even aware of that site, I, I hate to say. Um, but I guess because uh, I need to start following you on Twitter, which I did. So that when you post them, I'll see things like this there for sure. So, there you go. Um, you know, when we come back, we're getting ready to take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk about, I want to hear about your orange pill moment, how you got orange pilled. I'm going to have a question for you. I ask everybody, what is Bitcoin according to Will Cole? Well, I don't ask everybody what Bitcoin is according to Will Cole, but I'm going to ask you what Bitcoin is according to Will Cole. And That'd be a great then, question. And then, because I mean, it's amazing. I get a lot of the same answers, but I get a lot of answers that are really different. I go, wow, I hadn't had that answer yet. So we're going to take a commercial break and we'll be right back after these words from our sponsor with more of Will Cole from ZapRite. And welcome back to the Bitcoin Boomer Show. I'm your host, Gary Leland. Here we talk about Bitcoin, and that's all we talk about, because that's all I care about. You know, there's Bitcoin and maybe 20,000 cryptocurrencies. I don't care about the other 20,000. I just care about Bitcoin, because Bitcoin is the only thing that matters when it comes to uh, digital gold, digital money, whatever you want to call it. Today, we're talking to Will Cole from ZapRite. Will, welcome back to the show. Um, now, now, here it is. I want to know. What is Bitcoin? Give us the, the, your definition, take as much time as you need. Some people just say digital cash and that's it, they're through. But what is Bitcoin to bull coal? <clears throat> yeah, so you know, I'll start with, I believe Bitcoin is money. And then specifically, I believe Bitcoin is money that is uh, best utilized as currently a savings technology. Um, so if I leave it at that, I think that's a little bit unsatisfying. So, you know, believing that Bitcoin is money was actually a fairly long process for me, right? Bitcoin looked interesting as a possible medium of exchange when I first learned about it. Um, it looked, um, like it could have certain use cases that dollars or euros or in-game gold couldn't have. This is back in 2012 or so. But over time, I came to appreciate Bitcoin as just money and potentially the best money. And then potentially the you know best you know global reserve currency overall. And I believe that once you make up your mind that Bitcoin is money, 
that, um, you know, what it becomes to you is a little bit more than just saying, you know, like, oh yeah, you know, US dollars are money or euros are money is that uh, you learn about Bitcoin's at core attributes and it is money that does what, right? Well, it is money that protects you from counterparties, right? Bitcoin's decentralized nature and the lack of a necessity of trusted third parties means that you can reduce counterparty risk. We talked about Cyprus before, right? Um, the reason that the Cyprus bail-in was possible is because of the government and the banking system, both counterparties to you uh, when you deposit money in a, a bank in Cyprus, that that is your counterparty risk that one of those uh, two counterparties could uh, betray you in some way, right? And that with Bitcoin, when you have your Bitcoin at rest, it is uh, possible. It's not always what people choose to do, but it is possible to store your Bitcoin um, in a way with no counterparties. And so if Bitcoin is money and US dollars are money, which one has a better story for how you can store it at rest? You know, save it, um, not touch it, not transact with it. That's just one use case, but as a savings technology or really just as a storage technology, Bitcoin, uh, I learned, was superior to fiat currencies in terms of custodying it over the long term. Then as a savings technology, I th uh, uh, it was really over the years of 12, 13, 14, and into 15, where um, knowing that Bitcoin had a 21 million uh, unit limit, right? But then really feeling that that limit was credible and unchangeable, right? And for that, I needed a lot of proof in the pudding, right? A lot of people can say, well, hey, this little thing's going to be scarce, this baseball card, and then they go print a bunch more baseball cards. Or they say, you know, we're targeting 2% inflation with the US dollar, which makes it relatively scarce compared to other currencies. But then, you know, they print, you know, 80% uh, of all dollars that have ever existed in a four year period, right? Those are incredible claims now. You cannot credibly say at any point in time that we're going to target and keep. U.S. Uh, dollars at a 2% inflation because we know that uh, they cannot keep that promise. So can Bitcoin keep the promise of the 21 million limit, which if they could, would give it a story on top of sort of the custody uh, thing that I mentioned earlier around being good for savings, like something like gold, which is credibly scarce on our planet. Um, and really, it wasn't like a single moment Right, uh, where Bitcoin was obvious to me uh, that that 21 million limit couldn't be changed. It was understanding what the consensus rules were, how the consensus rules could be changed. That's a really long topic in and of itself. But personally, I became convinced that the 21 million limit on Bitcoin could not be changed, uh, would not be changed, and it was completely infeasible for that to ever change. So that covered you know, store of value um, and uh, that aspect of Bitcoin being money. And then, it, you, know, you know, over time, better tools get built um, for uh, wallets, infrastructure, uh, different custody solutions that Bitcoin's really easy to spend and to send around to each other. That if you've ever had to uh, send international uh, transfers or wire money for any business purposes or individual purposes, um, or just be a business that accepts credit cards and um, and then you know sees how the fee structure and payouts and all of that affect your day to day business is that it it became clear to me over time that Bitcoin would continue to grow as a medium of exchange as well as being a store of value um, and so all of those things put together you know I came to the conclusion that Bitcoin was money and Bitcoin is money. And that it had all of these attributes to it that made it superior money in many, many different ways. How did you, how'd you actually find out about Bitcoin originally? Yeah, uh, I, I've, I've, I've spent a lot of time trying to figure out what my first moment of, uh, you know, scouring old emails and stuff like that. Best I can tell, I heard about it first in April of 2011. Uh, that doesn't mean I was like buying it or took it particularly seriously at that time. but. I don't think I was really aware of Bitcoin on any level other than hearing the word or something like that thrown out there. In April 2011, I was in New York City and I was uh, 
you know, hanging around a bunch of people that had worked on Ron Paul's campaign. I believe they were now at that point working on Gary Johnson's presidential campaign, but they were ostensibly, you know, Ron Paul people. And there were several people in that um, little group in New York um, that were pretty into Bitcoin uh, already, you know, on the mining side, you know, all of that. I, I hadn't, you know, I, I think I've probably heard about it before, but I hadn't taken it seriously. And that group of people, uh, along with my older brother, um, were the people that sort of opened my eyes to it. Uh, since we're on the subject of, uh, I guess, orange pilling or whatever, your mother-in-law is Senator Loomis. Did you orange pill her? Or did she find that out on her own? And then y'all had a mutual subject to talk about. Yeah. Yeah, I've been asked this a bunch. Uh, you know, I did introduce her. I guess Bitcoin, it's an obvious but question. I'm always very quick to point out that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is it, you know, I, I introduced her to the idea of Bitcoin, uh, I believe in 2013. Um, but uh, orange pilling is the wrong word with Cynthia because I think it took like five minutes. Uh, you know, normally when you orange pill someone, you're spending a lot of time with someone, you're you're covering all their, you know, anti arguments with, uh, with Senator Lummis. Um, and she wasn't a Senator at the time. Uh, it was, it was very simple, you know, introduced it, talked about it for five minutes and within five minutes, she seemed to get it implicitly, you know, entirely and just said, okay, let's start buying some. <laughs> right. And, and from there on out, like there was no convincing, uh, she did her own research. Uh, you know, so I can, I can take credit for introducing the uh, topic to her, but uh, in terms of her understanding of it and what she's done, you know, in, in the U S government, you know, all credit to Cynthia. She's, she is uh, unbelievable in many ways. Yeah. I think she, well, I don't think she just submitted a, a bill, I guess, to make um, Bitcoin a strategic asset and stockpile Bitcoin. Yeah. yeah. I was talking to someone the other day about that, and uh, they were like, oh, that's a stupid idea. And then I was watching a show, uh, something on YouTube about it. I think on the show it said that we stockpile $2 billion worth of cheese as a strategic asset. And I was like going, "Absolutely." I'm going, we stockpile cheese as a strategic asset, but there are people against Bitcoin as a strategic asset? That makes no damn difference. It makes no sense. But uh, we're going to take a break right now, a word from our sponsor, and we'll be right back after this word. And also, please share this show with your friends. Like I said earlier, helps us out. It helps them out. We don't have any Bitcoin we're going to sell you. We just want to teach you about Bitcoin. We'll be right back after this word from our sponsor. And welcome back to the Bitcoin Boomer Show. We're, we're joined by Will Cole today from Zaprite. Will, welcome back to the show. Um, thank you for the um, the information there on uh, Senator Lummis. To know that you didn't really do a lot of orange pilling, you just uh, mentioned it to her and told her real quick. That's got to be some quick orange pilling, though. Know, five minutes. It took me a whole day. I mean, you know. So she's a smart. She's well, not. She's a yeah, nice I lady for sure, but she's evidently pretty smart too. Yeah, I would say that, you know, Cynthia had a really good background to understand Bitcoin quickly. You know, she had she had been, you know, uh, a rancher. She had been an entrepreneur. She had been the state treasurer of Wyoming prior to any, you know, federal, uh, you know, uh, positions. And so it just kind of seems, you know, sometimes you find like the programmer who's been thinking about decentralized systems or cryptography, or you find the finance person who has been dissolution by the dollar, uh, you know, and sometimes it's the, you know, Austrian economist. Uh, Cynthia just had some of the prerequisites where it didn't take much, you know, uh, uh, for it to make sense uh, really quickly. One thing I do want to get into now is ZapRite. You and Parker Lewis... Is it just the two of you that started that? I didn't know if there's anyone else involved or is this y'all's baby? No. Uh, so John McGill is actually the founder, the original founder of ZapRite. And uh, John, uh, Parker and I met him while he was working out of the Bitcoin Commons when Parker and I were at uh, Unchained Capital or Unchained now. Uh, and 
So we were aware of ZapRite as John was building it up. Um, when Parker and I stepped aside from Unchained, we were just looking at lots of different ideas for new businesses that we could do in the Bitcoin space. Um, I mean, no idea was off limits. Uh, and we we just knew we wanted to work together. And of the several things we narrowed down that we could spend our time on, one of them was payments because Parker was launching his Gradually Then Suddenly book. And um, and we were you know trying out different options of how he was going to sell this thing. And none of them actually quite fit what he wanted to do. And then I had, you know, was going to be starting my, my Tools of Ignorance blog and I you know, was going to take donations there. And it was just kind of surprising to us because, you know, we had a pretty simple set of what we wanted to do, which is uh, we wanted a non-custodial solution. So, you know, that, that took out things like BitPay and stuff like that. Uh, where Bitcoin went directly to a wallet of our choosing. So if I had a you know a coal card already or a Trezor or you know anything you know set up, then I could just point the invoice or point the checkout to my wallet that I already had. You know I, I'd already made some decisions in terms of where I was comfortable custing my Bitcoin. Why couldn't Bitcoin just go straight to that wallet in an e-commerce case? And we looked around and we looked around and we just really couldn't find anything that 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 fit. Um, I know there's BTC Pay server of which I'm a big fan. I know all of us at Zapper are big fans, but that that wasn't really the point. Like we weren't looking to run a server or run infrastructure or that type of overhead. I just I just wanted the Bitcoin to go to my wallet. We couldn't find anything until we remembered John at Zapperite, and uh, John had built a business invoicing product uh, that. Uh, he was a freelancer. Uh, he had been doing work at Bull Bitcoin. He was sending out invoices to clients. Uh, he wanted the option to be paid in Bitcoin in a non-custodial way. And so he had built... I remember my aha moment with ZapRite was looking at what he had built with that and seeing his connections page. And it was a bunch of different wallets you could hook in and you could accept Bitcoin payments to any of those wallets for paying an invoice. We're like, oh my gosh, this is exactly what we want to build. Only we want to do it in context other than just business invoicing. Maybe John wants to do that too. So Parker and I talked to John for several weeks and decided that, you know, instead of, you know, him just doing business invoicing and us running off and doing e-commerce and some other things that we'd be better off together. And so, uh, yeah, John McGill, a uh, great Bitcoiner, and uh, he did a fabulous job uh, building ZapRite even before uh, Parker and I had joined. Well, I have to say, I use uh, ZapRite. Um, I was using Ibex, which I, which I was happy with Ibex as far as for receiving um, payments, um, but it did not have the feature to send invoices, which is fantastic um, for me, especially when it comes yeah. to sponsors. You know, because I'd send a sponsor and they go, I want to pay. Can you send me an invoice? And I'd send me an sure. invoice and go, oh, I want to pay in Bitcoin. So I said, well, send it to this wallet address. You know, number one, it was a little more uh, communication involved rather than just receiving an invoice and saying, pay in fiat, pay in Bitcoin. I mean, to me, it's a great product for that. And it came out at a really good time for me seeing how Ibex had pulled out of the United States. And I needed a replacement. And then, then all of a sudden, ding, ding, ding. Oh, yeah, Parker and Will are doing uh, ZapRite. Let me get in touch with them. Because I'd already set it up. I just had not done anything with it. So I've been very happy with uh, a ZapRite. So as someone who's a user, and um, I guess maybe I use it more than many people since I'm running a whole BitBlock Boom conference with it, it is fantastic, I believe. Um, so So... Y'all should be very happy. Is it going, everything going how you expected or you're ahead of uh, progress or where you thought you'd be? Um, what's happening? Yeah. So, you know, Zephyr's really, uh, is a really exciting company in a lot of ways. I mean, you know, for a long time, I know there's always this, this discussion is, you know, is Bitcoin ever going to make the leap into being a, a medium of exchange uh, on a large scale basis? Right. And, um, you know, I'm realistic in the sense that, like, you know, Bitcoin's not that right now. But uh, in a lot of ways, I think that um, we're using sort of pre-Lightning Network and pre-Layer 2 uh, biases against, you know, what we should be working towards for a future where if you think Bitcoin is money, 
how do people use money? And ultimately, if Bitcoin is considered money, uh, uh, which I think is increasing in adoption, uh, that that mindset that of course people are going to you know use Bitcoin as money as a medium of exchange. In terms of timing on that, it's 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 just like you know I don't think it's a chicken or egg type of proposition where it's like well you know, how's it going to work? Are people going to demand to start paying in Bitcoin or are people going to demand to start receiving in Bitcoin? I think, I think it's very clear that people are not going to demand to pay in Bitcoin, but people are going to demand to be paid in Bitcoin. Uh, the fact that uh, the number one way to obtain Bitcoin right now is through FX exchange, I think is unlikely to hold true over the long term. That for most people, they acquire money through selling their goods and services, their time, their talents, um, through work and entrepreneurship, and that that will end up being uh, the obvious way to obtain Bitcoin over time. So, in terms of what's going on right now for us, is we're just sort of slowly going through each type of transaction type that scratches our own itch and that we want to help facilitate on behalf of our customers. With the basic idea of being you as a human being want more Bitcoin. And one of the ways you can do that is to accept Bitcoin as payment for yourself as a contractor, for your business on a primary basis. And so we've built e-commerce tools, integrations with sites like WooCommerce, uh, payment links where you can send off one-off uh, SKUs to be paid in Bitcoin, business invoicing, and very recently, a very simple POS, a uh, point of sale system where you can in-person accept Bitcoin really simply. And what really differentiates ZapRite from other places where you can do this already is that it's very likely you can take your existing wallet that you're already using um, and um, and plug that in and Bitcoin will go directly to that. You can do it with a hardware wallet. You can do it with a custodial account like... Um, like Strike, you could do it with a non-custodial, but you know, uh, a collaborative custody thing like Unchained. You can hook these wallets up and accept Bitcoin directly to a custody solution that you're already familiar with. And then, lastly, what we do that I think is a little bit different is that we put the option to pay with Bitcoin with the option to pay with fiat. If you prefer to do that, you know, we're realists that you know businesses have obligations and expenses in dollars. They need to also accept dollars. So we integrate with the likes of Stripe or Square or PayPal and Venmo so that you can accept payments in both. And then you can play all the games you want. You can charge a premium on the fiat if you're trying to prioritize receiving Bitcoin or reverse that and make it a discount for Bitcoin instead of a premium for fiat. There's all sorts of things you can do there then to incentivize the type of payments that you want to receive. Well, there's a a lot more I want to go over with ZapRite, but we're going to take a break right now for a word from our sponsor. And when we get through with that, we'll be back with Will Cole from ZapRite. Talk a little bit more about that. See you in a minute. Awesome. <laughs> and welcome back to the show. We're here to talk about Bitcoin. That's all we ever talk about. If you watch this show on a regular basis, you know that. And today we have Will Cole from ZapRite explaining ZapRite and talking Bitcoin. Welcome back to the show, Will. Thanks, Gary. Now, I, one question I have is, and I don't understand what happened. Um, this isn't necessarily ZapRite, but I'm just wondering how this may pertain to ZapRite in the future. You know, as I said earlier, I was using IBEX for my payments, and they completely pulled out of the U.S. due to regulatory uh, rulings, I guess. Do you all have any concern about that over the long haul, or is there anything you're doing differently than they were doing that that, uh, makes you not as concerned about that? Sure. Um, Well, you know, we're always looking out for, you know, we're compliant you know, a company in the United States uh, will always be a compliant company in the United States. Uh, There's some big differences between us and IBEX. Uh, The the main issue with IBEX was the question of money transmission and the need to obtain money transmission licenses. So a lot of companies, uh, particularly ones that actually do custody on behalf and then facilitate transactions on top of uh, actually taking control and custody of funds. Uh, they have to go out and get these licenses in the United States, that's state to state. Uh, so, you know, companies like Coinbase, you know, big exchanges all the way down to like, you know, Unchained uh, will go obtain these licenses so they can do businesses in those states. IBEX, I don't believe had any or maybe very few of those money transmission 
minter licenses. And so there became a point where uh, that became like an unviable strategy because, you know, they operate very similar to the way, say, uh, some fiat companies would operate, which is when you receive Bitcoin, it goes to their wallet, they have custody over the funds, and then they pay you out. At least that's my understanding of, of how they work. You're correct. Uh, uh, every, for every Zappa, day, it's a yeah. very, very different model. Remember... Well, I was going to say every day at around, I don't know, a certain time of the day, six o'clock, midnight, whatever, you'd get a payment from them for if you made three sales a day sure. in Bitcoin, you got a payment for those three. So it definitely went to their wallet and then to yours. Yeah, and that, that's pretty classic money transmission is when you take custody and then you facilitate payments out, uh, then, then you would be a money transmitter. In Zapright's case, uh, we can't pay you out because we never have custody over funds, ever. Uh, you prov- It's kind of a bring your own wallet experience. You have a Bitcoin wallet that you like and that you're comfortable with, and then you make a connection with Zapright, and then whatever reason you're using Zapright for, whether it be business invoicing or a WooCommerce store, or you're setting up payment links or doing a point of sale, those funds go directly to you. So we can't we can't intermediate in any way between you and your money. Now, if you choose a custodial account, like say a strike, uh, then you know funds will go to strike. And of course, you, you would have to withdraw or spend from there. But strike has money transmitter licenses all over the place. So Zaprite is helping facilitate uh, payments, but we're not strictly a payment processor in sort of the traditional mode where we don't take control over funds. We can't pay you out because we can't you know, we don't touch any money ever. I actually think that this is kind of the Bitcoin native way of doing payments, which is, you know, I like these sort of in-between businesses, I call them, where, you know, at Unchained, we did this in-between business where on one extreme, Coinbase was holding all of your money. And on another extreme, you were, you know, had your own hardware wallets running open source software, which could be kind of scary, especially inheritance and things like that. And then Unchained found this like unique trade-off level where you were sovereign, you you lost privacy, but you were sovereign over your funds, um, which was, I thought, a very Bitcoin native way to do things. Zapright is similar, where on one extreme you have like the BitPays of the world or the Ibexes, where you ha- uh, where they take custody and they pay you out. On the other extreme, you might have something like uh, like BTC Pay Server, where you have to run the infrastructure and the server infrastructure in order to take payments. We kind of find this middle ground where it's like, well, we won't touch any of the money. Yes, you have another counterparty in terms of privacy, right? We do see transactions and provide reporting and things like that. But a lot of people see that as a benefit because it helps them with their accounting for their businesses and and things like that. Well, actually, also with the way that you guys do it, sending it to my wallet, it seems like to me it's cheaper than using um, someone else because someone else is going to charge you a percentage And if you're a high volume company doing business in Bitcoin, I mean, don't y'all just charge like a a monthly fee or something? Yeah, currently we're charging just a monthly fee. We sell it like SaaS software. I want to be very clear. That's not the only way we'll, we'll monetize in the future. Like we will do transaction fees in the, in the future, but because we're not custodians, it allows us to have much, much lower fees than traditional fiat partners, right? So a a traditional fiat partner processing credit cards, right, is going to take some sort of fixed fee amount per transaction plus a transaction fee. And you might think that you're getting really ripped off in that world. A lot of people feel that way. I mean, I feel that way when I see those fees. However, it's a hyper-competitive market, whether you're talking about the credit card world or you're talking about the payment processor world, uh, you know, between Square... These are these are commoditized businesses. These are bottom of the barrel pricing in order to run these operations, right? So I have to assume, given the competitive nature of those markets, that it's not a lot. It's not not easy to get a lot cheaper in that on that on those rails. But in the Bitcoin world, we don't have to run a lot of the infrastructure that they're running, right? Our overhead and costs can be far far lower uh, than uh, in the traditional fiat world. So that, you know, there's still a cost to doing business, right. And there's still a service being provided and value being created, but we can do so at a much lower cost because of the Bitcoin network, the open source nature of the project and the non-custodial option that we built. Well, I like what you built and I've enjoyed using what you've built. Um, for sure. I, I do want to, so we don't run out of time. I want to make sure you tell everybody where they can find, you follow you, Zap right, give us all the pertinent uh, links. 
Yeah, sure. Uh, first, go check out Zapprite, uh, zapprite.com. Uh, you can do a free 30-day trial before you make any commitments. Uh, if you have a wallet in mind uh, or uh, or just want to explore what we're doing, uh, check that out. You can follow me at Will Cole on Twitter. It's pretty much the only place I pay attention. I can't paste my InPub in here, but I'm on Noster as well. And then I'm writing about software development and Bitcoin at the tools of ignorance.xyz. Very good. Now, now that I see we have some, uh, we have two and a half minutes here, I have a question for you. Um, oh, why? And I've and I've pondered with this for a while. A lot of people I know that Parker is real big on charging more if you're paying fiat than he does for mm-hmm. uh, if you're paying for Bitcoin. But there are other places that really don't look at it that way. They just give you like a twenty percent discount for Bitcoin. I'm sure. always confused on that. Why wouldn't the company just take the fiat and then with that 20% that they've got extra buy Bitcoin? Yeah, so I think that there's different ways to think about this. Uh, the first way is what are you trying to incentivize as a merchant, right? If I want to be paid in Bitcoin, what's the best way to incentivize getting that Bitcoin, right? If I don't care what I'm going to be paid in, right, um, then then maybe you don't do any discount or any premium. But I feel like the fiat premium is the best way to incentivize the Bitcoin payment because you now are, while while USD is your unit of account, right? Your preferred method method of payment is Bitcoin. And you're basically punishing people who don't, you know, uh, who don't, uh, who don't pay in Bitcoin. And I feel like the, that sense of loss of paying with a uh, fiat uh, w- would overcome many of the customers in that case. But also, you know, you have to allow for the discount side of things, because if you're doing a business invoice, for instance, and you agreed to say a $5,000, you know, piece of work that you were going to do, you can't very well then show an invoice that says like, well, but if you pay me in dollars, it's $5,200. You know, you can't, you can't, you know, do a premium there. So then you can show your preference by just saying, you know, there's a discount on the Bitcoin. Also, I think that people would want to accept Bitcoin rather than taking the fiat and converting it because ultimately it would be much cheaper, right? Uh, there are large spreads and fees associated with, you know, FX transactions around, you know, going to an exchange and buying Bitcoin. And that actually the most, you know, cost effective way of earning Bitcoin is not, you know, sell something in fiat, take all the fee hits on fiat and all the taxes and everything, and then go to an exchange and buy Bitcoin and pay all the fees and the uh, spreads and everything on that. It's just to take it on a primary basis. It ends up being much cleaner, much faster, uh, much cheaper. Well, I have to admit, I do like being paid in Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> you have to admit that. Yeah. Every time I see the invoice come through and it's paid in Bitcoin, a little smile comes to my face. You know, but uh, someone like me yeah. who's never sold any Bitcoin, you know, after a few years, that really helps out. Hey, Will, we got about 15 seconds left, so I'm going to end it. Thank you for coming on the show. I really do appreciate it, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Gary, thank you too, man. Good to see you. Have a good day. Okay, we'll be right back after this word from our sponsor. And welcome back to the Bitcoin Boomer Show. I hope you've enjoyed today's show with Will Cole. It was nice hearing about Bitcoin in 2013. I wish I was in the Bitcoin back then and was getting Bitcoin at $60, $70. That'd be exciting. And hearing about ZapRite. Stephanie, my great producer here, what did you think of the show? Do you have any uh, questions or input you wanted to add? Info from the peanut gallery there? I think um, ZapRite sounded like a really useful tool for businesses, but now my question to you is your connection, like you knew Senator Lummis was his um, mother-in-law, I think you said. Yes. And what's the story there? Because that's really cool that well, she's... when we wrote the book, Bitcoin and the American Dream, we wrote that book, Annalise, which is Will's wife. Okay. Well, that's Senator Lummis's daughter. Yeah. So we took us a week to write that book, so I got to know her pretty good. And then when we did the book opening or the book release, we all went up to uh, D.C., mm. and she held an event for us and had staffers there from other senators for our book release. And then actually even 
uh, we went over to her condo to uh, sign copies of the books. I think we signed like a thousand copies of the book, all seven of us. And then she even gave us a tour of the Capitol during COVID. So there was no one in the building. It was gr the best tour of the Capitol you could ever have. Nobody was in there except for us, basically, and a few staffers. So I kind of got to, to know her pretty good spending a day with her. But speaking of Bitcoin and the American Dream, please check out uh, my book, Bitcoin and the American Dream at bitblockboom.com slash books. I also want to make sure you know about the conference I hold every year in April in Dallas, Texas. Check out bitblockboom at bitblockboom.com. This is the eighth year coming up in April for bitblockboom, making us the world's oldest and longest running Bitcoin conference. So if you're anywhere please check out BitBlock Boom. And this isn't just for Dallas. I have people come from Australia, from the Netherlands, from all over the world. So do check out BitBlock Boom. I also want to make sure you know to follow me on Twitter. My handle is Gary Leland. It makes me pretty easy to find. I'm pretty much Gary Leland everywhere. So check out my Twitter account. And one more thing I want to make sure you know about is uh, my monthly meetup at the meetup.com slash bitblockboom. We usually have a barbecue once a month in Dallas, Texas. Great barbecue. So do check out meetup.com slash bitblockboom and hang out with a bunch of Bitcoiners and eat uh, barbecue. That's it for today's show. I will see you next week. But remember, please share this show with your friends. You're doing them a favor by helping them learn about Bitcoin. Because like I said, I'm not selling Bitcoin. I'm just giving away information. Until next week, remember to stack those sats. See you later.